I'm here today to talk to a missing witness from the Westall UFO incident that took place in a suburb of Melbourne in 1966. So hi Derek. Oh hello. Hi. Thanks for um, coming forward and sharing your story with us. Why don't you start with what happened on that fateful day oh, okay. at Westall? Yeah, well, um, oh, I, I remember I had to front at Thomastown East uh, in the morning a little bit earlier because we had to be at Westall on time for school to start. And uh, we got there, it was pretty much a normal day. Uh, there was kids on the oval playing and so on. I headed straight for the swings uh, which were at the left of the oval, bottom left of the oval, and uh, began playing. Uh, when the bell went for kids to go in, I kind of had a really strong urge not to do so, not to follow everybody else, but just to stay there and play. Uh, kind of out of character at the time, but I never really thought about it. Being a six-year-old, uh, playing in the swings was much more exciting than having to go inside the class. Uh, so I stayed. Um, I think it was probably a, you know an hour or so, not long after that, and one of the teachers came over to me and said to me, uh, why aren't you in class? And I said, oh, well, I don't really want to go to class, and my teacher told me I can play the swings, which was a lie, but it, it sort of managed to persuade him at the time, and he turned around and walked back into the school. And he actually walked in the side of the school entrance, uh, didn't go up either end. Oh, I remember him doing that. So I just kept playing and thinking, oh, good, I've got away with it. And then probably another hour or so, not long after that, I um, was on a chain and bar and I actually swung out and landed on the ground and fell. I, I fell on the ground and as I fell and went to get back up, I, I heard a noise in the sky. And the noise was, was probably like a, a little bit like a bull roarer that the Aboriginals used to spin, but much quicker. And, and there was like a clicking and a staticky type affair. And I thought it was quite unusual, so as I looked, I saw three silver crafts circling the school. And they were, as they were circling, they were going around to the, to the left and going lower all the time. And that was the only time I really seen three craft. But I, I got a bit of a fright and decided to, to let people know. And I ran straight up to the entrance that Mr Greenwood had gone in just earlier. And I went, leaned into a, a doorway of the classroom and I yelled out, oh, these things are in the sky, Mr Greenwood, these things are in the sky. And I ran back outside the classroom, out the side entrance toward the playground again. And uh, as I ran out, I pointed to these objects, which, which by this were starting to hover over the Grange, and yelled at some kids at the other end of the, the sports table that were playing sport or doing something, that there's silver things in the sky. And I was a little bit... Um, what could you say, I felt a little bit strange because I looked back and none of the students or teachers were following me. I thought, well, either they didn't hear me or maybe they're getting ready to come out. So I just thought, well, I'm not missing out, I'm going to go and have a look. So I jumped the fence immediately where the swings were, uh, ran across the top uh, of the oval toward the right-hand corner, and I, st I still couldn't see anything, and there was a bit of an elongation where you had to go down to like a, a flat area. And the barbed wire fence was down along where the flat area was. I crawled under the barbed wire fence. Uh, the grass being as high as it was, couldn't see anything. I decided to, just only metres away, climb a, a corner barbed wire fence post. I thought maybe if I get on top of that, I'll be able to see what's going on. And there were these supports that come out either side of the post, which made it very easy to climb up. Being barbed wire, it was easy to cut yourself. So I stood up on the post, and as I got up and, and lifted my body and turned, I saw the craft in the grass and then within seconds I saw this door open and these three things come out. Uh, they had like hoods and capes on but very fast towards me. I could actually see the grass parting and stopped right in front of me. Uh, they were very spindly. They were uh, yellow, uh, more of a grey than yellow, browny colour. Their heads were like almond shaped, very thick forehead, very big black eyes. Their black eyes reminded me of actually a, a Tom Bowler, like a reported in there that I used to play marbles with. Being a kid, that's probably what I thought of. Uh, the arms and legs were very spindly, four fingers, no thumbs. Um, I wasn't so much in fear of them, but I was more so in fear of what they were going to do. And I hear this voice inside my head saying that we're not going to harm you, but you have to come down now. And I thought to myself, I'm not going anywhere with you. You can go jump, so to speak. 
And uh, the next thing I knew, uh, the, I saw the guy at the front kind of look like he touched the uh, triangular silver shaped emblem on his chest and then they turned almost like automatically and speared off in um, single file back to the craft. Just as they'd gone in and I saw the door go down, I fainted and passed out and fell onto the inside of the paddock just on the ground. Uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't passed out as such and I, I, I was a little bit shook up by falling and I got up straight away. And as I got up straight away and looked, this craft was actually rising, uh, turning at an angle once it got to a certain height and Fush took off over the school virtually back that way. And it, it was then that I noticed the aircraft that was circling over, overhead. And I, count, I first thought there was only one and I'm seeing the same one, but then I realised there was more and they were all the same. Um, and by then, the, the children and kids and students and teachers were everywhere. Uh, some were milling around where the, where the saucer had landed. I also walked over and was looking, and there was probably about half a dozen students there all looking at this thing. There were some a little bit distance away lying on the ground, and I noticed that the ground was very flat. Uh, the grass was a yellowy brown. It was... Uh, swirled in a clockwise formation. There was also another uh, area that was about two feet wide leading off from the circle for some distance and it wasn't flat but it was the same colour as the grass in the circle. Anyway, uh, I still remember to this day walking on it feeling how hard the impression was underneath my feet but what kind of really amazed me was the tail that led away, when you stood on it, even though the grass was still there, it turned to dust. It literally just turned to dust under your feet. Mm. And um, I kind of had it on my feet and my shoes and tried to get it off. And then a, a teacher was standing at the top, not far from where these girls were sitting down on the ground, and said, everybody's to go back to the oval immediately. So we did. And as I got up to the top, climbed over the fence like all the others, there's these military vehicles just pulling up with men with fatigues getting out of them. There was two jeeps parked in front and there was an ambulance behind. Um, we were all assembled at the Oval not long after that. Some of the our students were talking about what we'd just seen and what happened and we were quickly separated and told, you know, you have to go to assembly, there's uh, some announcements being made, blah, blah, blah. So we went along to assembly and uh, I don't know who the teacher was, it was probably the headmaster, I don't really remember, basically said that uh, it's all a military exercise, it's very secret, it's important to the military, no one's to say anything, it's just an experimental balloon type of affair and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, I stood there and uh, even though being only six years old, I knew straight away that was a lie and I knew it was pointless telling anybody, they weren't going to believe you because the adult, adults were saying this and you as a child were saying that. So I kind of let it go. Um, and for some reason we left early that day. Um, another parent came and picked us up that were going to West Orr from, from East Thomastown and we were taken back to East Thomastown School. I never went back to West Orr, ever. Um, I tried to talk about it to my family, especially my father when I got home and I was advised not to. Um, he was very nice about it. He just said it's the sort of thing that you shouldn't have to talk about because it's important for security, for military and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, I thought, well, I, you know, I respected my father and I loved him, so I kind of thought it was a good idea. About two days later, uh, we were all playing out in the front street in Lancel Court and uh, these two military guys pulled up in a brand new, big, shiny black Dodge. Uh, we all noticed the car and, of course, we hovered around and had a good look at it inside and so on and these guys got out and said now don't touch it. Now it wasn't unfamiliar for military to come to our house because my father had not long left the Navy but I noticed that these guys were dressed in different military uniforms to the regular guys that came. They were, I think they were from memory in blue uniforms and uh, they weren't at our house very long, probably only 15-20 minutes and about half an hour had gone by and they had left and my father called me back inside uh, and instead of talking to me in the lounge room or the hallway he dragged me out into the backyard right up near the back fence and basically said to me you have to promise me you're not going to say anything about what you saw 
And I said, I already told you that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say nothing. He said, it's very important that you don't. I said, okay, okay. So, of course, nothing more was discussed. Uh, later in the day, uh, my brother came home from school and uh, I, I don't know how much he knew about it or whether Dad had even spoke to him about it, but he kind of pulled me aside later and he said, you know, you're not to say anything about that. And I looked at him, I said, well, how do you know, sort of thing. He said, Dad told me, but you're not the same. I thought, oh, yeah, I heard the first time, you know. So we, we kind, I kind of left what happened there to telling just my immediate friends. And uh, there wasn't any of those that were Westall. Most of them all went to Epping. The, the, the students I ended up going to Westall with, I didn't know at all. So um, I never really seen any of them again. Mm -hmm. Can we go back to the craft? Can yes. you describe the craft? Yeah, the craft was silver. It had a, a, a bulby type light fair on top. It had like a, uh, it was like a two stage thing. It had a top section and a bottom section. Uh, it was a very highly polished, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't really make out doors or see anything like that in it. And uh, the one thing that struck me was a little bit odd was the door that when it opened it never went up, it never went down, it's like the centre went sideways. Mm -hmm. And they kind of come out very quickly. Uh, I got the impression that uh, the, the craft was, um, it was something hot mm -hmm. because I saw kind of heat radiating off it. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as getting get a good look at it, occasionally there was like a, a bluey, yellowy, greeny hue. Mm -hmm. And what about the size? The size? Mm. The size was about the size of two motor cars. It wasn't very big, it was quite small. Mm -hmm. um, what, at, at length to length you mean? Length to length it would probably be probably uh, 20 feet. Mm -hmm. The diameter would have been probably 30 feet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the sides, the, the elongation from the top came down and it stopped and there was like a um, uh, a skirty type affair in the middle and then it, it bulged out a little bit and then straight down to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no visible lights from the from the ground up, only the one on top. Mm -hmm. I never saw any lights or any anything like that until it took off. And when these beings came out of the craft, mm -hmm. how did they get to you? They, they floated. They floated. And very quickly. I, I actually was quite stunned because I saw them coming out and my immediate thought was, oh, look at that, I'll watch these, see what they're going to do. And they shot towards me that quick, I really didn't have time to react. I really didn't have time to do anything. Mm. And, um, yeah. So. How, how high were they off the ground? Uh, they were probably about two feet off the ground. Their, their feet, they only had like four toes, they didn't have a main toe and they were hanging down like that and I could see the feet sweeping through the tops of the grass. Mm, okay, mm. interesting. Mm. <laughs> Their arms and legs didn't move, they were just like that and they just flop really quickly toward me. The first thing I probably noticed was their eyes. Mm. So they were big and black and shiny and I thought they were quite unusual. Mm, mm. Um, as far as their dress was concerned, they, they had, they had a, like a, a cape type of affair uh, you could still see in between the cape and the head. They had like black hair, but it was like straw. Um, I couldn't see any teeth. Their mouth was quite small, like a slit of a mouth. There were no discernible ears in between what they had on in the head. I couldn't see any ears. Uh, when one blinked, they all blinked. That was quite strange. Mm. And there seemed to be a mechanical or automated type movement between the three. Uh, one didn't, didn't do anything independent without the others. Mm. It was all like if one moved, they all moved, mm. and this type of thing. Yeah. So you're the, for, for people who've seen the Westall 66 documentary, mm. I remember one of the uh, witnesses was saying that there was this small boy who ran in and yelled out, Mr. Greenwood, Mr. Yep. Greenwood. So you're that person, are you? I'd say, I'd, I'd say that's you the think, case. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so now people can know who you are. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> that's right. And I was only a small boy. I was only six years old. I wasn't really big for six. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And it kind of fits because if you hear what some of the other witnesses say, 
and and you hear my story, it, it fits. The timelines fit. Yes. Um, if it didn't fit, I would say there's a missing piece or a missing puzzle somewhere. But it seems to fit perfectly. Mm. And how many of those craft did you see? I saw three initially circling the school, and uh, when the one landed, I didn't see the other two again. Mm. I only saw the one on the ground and I saw the one tag off. I never saw another three in the sky after that or with the planes. The planes seemed to be more concerned with following the one that had landed and took off. I don't know where the other two were once I started to go down to the back of the range. Mm -hmm. I only saw them that one time flying and circling. I got the impression first because the one that landed was bigger because the other two were in a distance, but then I kind of thought about it and realised due to depth of perception, they were probably all the same, mm. because the other two were further back. Yeah. Mm. And it was like, as I was circling, and of course as this other craft took off, there was like a, a swishing sound, like you'd had a stick and swished it through the air and you were making that type of noise. It was like air being displaced. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now you've had a lot of other things have happened to you since yes, I then. Have. Yes. Yeah. Would you like to tell us some of those? Okay. Well, it, it wasn't long after Westall. Uh, I was only a couple of months from my sixth birthday, and about two weeks after Westall, I was actually at the night time. My parents gave me some money, and I went to the shop to buy some lollies. And uh, I was walking back up underneath high voltage power lines toward my home when I noticed about 20 metres away that I thought a family was carrying a bunch of torches and, and shining it toward me. So I started running. I thought I'll, I'll run past them. And as I got the same level as to where these lights were, I couldn't really see anything because I was flashing it in my face. And I ended up running in mid-air as I become parallel with where these lights were and the lights had stopped. And I turned to the left to look and I could see a craft only two metres away from where I was standing and then I become paralysed, I couldn't move and then these two, I like to call them little robots, that's what I called them at the time of Westall, uh, were already out of the craft, the door was already open and they grabbed me and lifted me up from the back and were virtually holding me head high and then dropped me down as we went into this craft. They were exactly the same creatures that I saw at Westall uh, this time there wasn't three, there was only two. Uh, they took me inside this craft which appeared larger inside than what it did from the outside. Uh, inside was, was lit up white. I could see like uh, white ceiling and white lights, but I couldn't see any further out, only the immediate area I was in. They sat me on a, what was like a silver chair, and the chair even though it was metal, had an ability to just sort of fold back, which I thought was pretty strange because most times if you're in a deck chair, you have to unclick something, whatever. This thing kind of done it automatically. And uh, they inserted a, um, a small pallet up my nose about the size of a match head and it hurt a lot and my nose bled and they said, you'll be all right. Uh, and then I woke up in the grass back outside uh, the craft was gone, the beans were gone, uh, my nose was still bleeding and I felt very nauseated. I got up and I realised I didn't have my lollies with me anymore. I looked around on the ground, I managed to find most of them and I ran home to my fence, jumped over and went home. I didn't feel very well so it wasn't long after that I'd actually gone to bed. I never told anybody, my father or family, because I felt, you know, after what I'd just gone through with Westall, I wasn't about to go down that road again. Uh, yeah, so that, that was kind of the affair there. They, they were dressed the same. They had, they had the black capes, uh, the same face, the same eyes, the same spindly hands and so on. Um, the only thing I noticed is a, a, a later abduction, I actually had the markings of their fingerprints on my back, which I'd never really noticed before that, not as a child anyway, mm. but as an adult I did, probably because of the difference in weight maybe, them happened to carry me the way they did. Mm. Uh, Whenever they they spoke to you, it was always through your mind. It was never through voice. Um, it didn't happen as a child. As a child, I had pretty good recollections of what they looked like and some of the things they did to me. Uh, what kind of changed as I got older and uh, through further abductions was they tried 
using a screen memory on me. They tried to make out that my, some of my best friends were there and some of my family members were there. But when I looked at these people, they looked like bad cartoons. Mm. Like I just thought, well, that's a joke. That's not them. You know, you can do better than that sort of thing. Mm. And then from that time on, there was no more screening. There was mm. always basically this is what you see is what you get mm. so you told me previously in when you're at Westall mm. that um, you had a feeling that you were in a euphoric child's playground yeah yeah that, that so that seems to indicate that somehow your emotions were being yes changed? yes I think one of the reasons for that was to, to keep your mind preoccupied as to what was really going on mm. um, I, I, I'd never seen toys that, that float and change colours and, and things like that. It wasn't quite normal, but at the same time, very fascinating. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, perhaps, so could it be possible they were trying to elicit those feelings to calm you? Or? No, no, no. The, uh, the, um, I, I noticed the, the, the abduction experience at Thomastown, uh, there, there was no toys or... or Strange playground at that mm, stage, mm. at that one. Uh, at a later date is, is when I faced that, when I was a little bit older. They, um, they had uh, cubes and, and balls and, uh, and uh, hexagons and all different shapes, and they kind of reminded me of the shapes that you get when you go to uh, physiotherapists and they make all these different things out of sponges. Mm. The only difference with these things was they could change colour they couldn't vibrate or, or anything like that, but they could change colour. And when you separate them, they'd all come back together like that. But the later experiences was completely different. I was actually surrounded by what looked like alien children. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to, sh to show them how to play. They wanted me to show them how to do things. And I, basically, I don't know how to play with these things. I've never seen them before. And one of the children came over I still remember it quite vividly, and he put his hands like that, he was a male, and this thing come up from the floor and he grabbed it. And I thought, oh, that's, that's pretty good. And at first I, I thought, oh, it must be the ball that's leaped up to his hands, but then he took his hands away and the damn ball stayed right there in midair. And then he kind of looked at me, and then the ball went back down to the floor as if to say, now you do it. And I thought, well, you know, I, I can't, I can't do that. And if I'm supposed to be teaching you how to play these things, it seems like you know more than I do. <laughs> so I kind of gave up and really didn't know what they wanted. Uh, that experience probably lasted about half an hour or so. Um, there, yeah. sorry. And you were showing us um, previously mm. the location of that on Google mm -hmm. Earth, and that where the craft had been, there was still a marking on the ground there all these years later. That's right. Yeah. Mm. That was quite surprising. I actually discovered that uh, some time ago. And again, I thought to myself, well, you could really put it down to being anything. You know, someone could have done anything over all these years there. But then I started to think about it a little more, and it was the, the exact location. Uh, the dimensions of the circle were exactly the same as Westall. Um, and if you look into the case history of where craft have landed previously, uh, these marks still have a tendency to last for a long time. Mm. So, you know... And also they're common against these high tension power... That's power right. I, I, I kind of looked into that as well. I couldn't understand why so, so many instances around power lines, especially concerning me mm. at the time, apart from the fact that I live right behind them. And uh, I think it has something to do with detection. I, I don't think that they're easily detected due to the frequency band overlap that the electromagnetic signals that the power lines put out. And if you look at the radar at the time, especially with what they were using, that's very much the case. Mm -hmm. Now you've also had some medical evidence yes. of uh, things that have been found in your body. Yes. Um, could you tell us about that? Uh, yes, I um, went through a period of having uh, seizures for um, about three months and they were completely debilitating and uh, very severe. Uh, after about three to six months of medical investigation and uh, a CT scan, they discovered a, um, what they called a tumour on my brainstem. Uh, the dimensions were 11 millimetres by 7 millimetres. Uh, I remember the object actually being put in in 2004 when I was abducted from in behind my ear. 
uh, even to this day, it's giving off a frequency. It's uh, electromagnetic. Uh, I have a couple of devices that go off when you run it near them, hence the metal detector beyond the neck. And uh, everything was kind of pointed towards the fact that it was an implant, especially considering the memories I had of it, because even to this day, the medical establishment can't give me a clear cut reason as to what it actually is or how to treat it. Mm -hmm. So what's your recollection of that being inserted into your body? Uh, I remember, uh, again, it's 2004, the three beings coming through the side of the wall of my, my unit. Uh, my cat was lying on my bed and she took off. Uh, I was paralysed. Uh, they lifted me up again from above their heads. Uh, we were floated up through the wall toward the craft. It was a cigar shaped craft. It had an opening in the bottom quite large. Even though I was uh, rendered unable to move, I could still see everything. I seen the, the roofs of the houses. I seen my neighbour's roof of their house. Uh, the next thing I knew, I was on a table that I felt was very familiar. Uh, again, a silver table, uh, flat, very cold to lie on, in the middle of this white lit room. They um, inserted a needle type device up my nose, my left nostril, and they pulled out what looked like a match head ball, and it was the one I recognised that they'd put in when I was abducted at Thomastown. Then they with the same device, inserted it in through my right ear, and I've still got the scar there, and uh, this time when they put it in, it didn't have the match head ball on the end, it had like a, um, a small length of match, if you wish, but a little bit wider, probably about 10 millimetres long, but it looked metallic, and it, it wasn't the same colour as the ball, it was actually a darker metallic, dark, a dark metal. Uh, Probably about, I don't know, uh, a year after, well no, probably a year after I met my wife, I had a lump right where they inserted it. And she said, there seems to be a, a fluidy sac there of some sort, and she squeezed it. And out come probably vile size of clear liquid. And it was the most hideous, disgusting, gross smell, and so strong. And we both just couldn't believe it, how, how strong the whiff of it was. And I've never had anything come out of my body that smelled like that. And it was right where they inserted this thing. And the scar is still there. Mm. Mm. And you, you think that that's where the entry point for the thing to yes. span on your brain yes. stand? Yes. Mm. Mm. And so the medical profession hasn't been able to find any, can't identify that at all, what was found on your brain stand? No. Mm. They're, they're calling it a lesion. Uh, the first time they took a CT scan of it, they managed to measure its dimensions. Uh, although they did mention in the report that I'd slightly moved, which caused a little bit of distortion in the image. Uh, over a year ago, I had another CT scan. Uh, it hadn't moved, it was still there. And according to their scan, it, it was slightly diminished. It was slightly smaller. And they said that may have been caused because the initial image wasn't quite correct. So it's probably been the same and hasn't changed. I saw that as, as these creatures came out and it was um, black and had like multi colours in it and it reminded me of Laminex. You get that black laminix that's got all those chippy little weirdo looking colours in it. But it, um, if it turned sideways, you probably wouldn't even see it. But because I saw it at an angle, I could see that it was round. I could see it was reasonably flat, but it was kind of alligated in the middle, even though it was still very thin. What was the diameter of that? It was probably about two or three feet, but it seems to change. It seemed to be able to go small and, and large into a ball or... Mm. Yeah. And what was that in relation to the craft? Well, when I, when I was at the post and the beings, the three beings come out and were standing right in front of me and were conversing with me, this thing was behind, back, in between the craft and them. And this was to do, not with Westall? Yes, or, no, oh, that this, was Westall. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah, this is at Westall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, right. I never saw it again anywhere else. Okay. Only at Westall. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah that's and it was, it, it was only uh, just above the grass. It was very low. 
And the reason why I notice this, because if, if you look out just ahead of you, you usually see grass, you see grass. But here's this black thing sitting right there. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know where it came from. I didn't see it arrive. I only noticed it as I was on the post and only when they came out. Hmm. And where did it go after that? I have no idea. I when the, the minute I, they turned and went back to the craft and I saw the door close, Vork is when I went and I didn't see it then either. I didn't, don't know where it went. So when you fainted, yes. do you have, I know you are a child at the time, mm. did you have any idea of, of the time from when you fainted? Oh, I got up immediately. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, no, I fainted, fell, and as I hit the ground, it shook me up. I got up straight away. And that was when I saw this thing start to rise. And uh, I, I, I haven't, I mentioned this in the report I gave you, but uh, the acrid smell of arc welding was very strong. Mm. My father's actually a fitter and turner, and even growing up, I could smell it. It drew me back to my childhood, and then many times I didn't know why. Mm. I could smell, I used to say to my father, every time I smell her, it reminds me when I was a kid. And he never really said anything to me, and I never really understood it either. Mm. And of course, until I got older. And Did he ever talk to you about those people who came to see him? No, the reason why is because my mother was married to a, an Italian. And just after the Westall incident, just after the accident, they went their separate ways. Um, I didn't see my mother for about four years and then when I was 10 years old she showed up out of the blue and whisked me and my brother and sister away to Queensland, the new daddy. Mm -hmm. Now I've been in touch with my father in Victoria who, who was my father at the time of Westall and the time of the abduction behind the fence and uh, I rang him to, to try and confirm some of these things that I remembered and to try and and get some information as to what actually happened to me in regards to the accident because I, I had no medical history or anything. And uh, when I got on the phone to him, I said to him, you know, I, I'll tell you what I, what I remembered last night. I had a dream and woke up and I remember an accident where I was thrown from the car and went under the back wheel. I said, I've got these scars on my face and on my body. I never really knew where they come from. And he said to me, I'll, I'll have to ring you back. And about half an hour later, he rang me back, and I could tell he was a little bit shook up about it. And he said to me, you mean to tell me your mother has never told you? And I said, no. And he said, uh, you're spot on, that really happened. He said, I can't believe that you can remember all that. And then I said to him, another side thing, apart from the accident, of course, uh, Westall, did I go to Westall school? He said, yeah, you did. He said, but we're not going to talk about that. Mm. Anyway, um, we had conversations about family members and basically how he'd been going and how I'd been going and what was happening in our lives. And then later that day, my older brother rang me, which was very unusual because he'd never rang me for years and years. And he basically said to me, how dare you ring Dad up and bring all this back from so many years ago? He's an old man. Do you realise how much that's shaken him up? And I said... I'm only trying to find out about my past. I'm only trying to find out about things that happened to me when I was a child. And he's the only one that can fill in the blanks. Mm. And he said, well, don't, don't ring again. And I, I never did. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about an accident. What, when did that happen and what happened? Well, the accident was about just before my birthday and about a week after the last abduction. We were driving home uh, from relative's place at Preston or Reservoir not quite sure there and we were only five minutes from our house and I don't know exactly what happened and this is what the strange thing about the whole scenario is the next thing I knew I was flying out the window my head went under the back wheel of the car I left my body instantly and I saw my body lying on the road I didn't really have an affinity with it I, I just thought it was a shell uh, I looked back at the car it, it had my parents' car had pulled up only just ahead of where I'd, where I'd gone out the vehicle and my father got out the driver's and I told him this, my father got out the driver's side, ran around the front of the car, came back and picked me up off the road in his arms like this. Uh, some neighbours had came out and said, oh, is he still alive? And my father said, I, I, I don't know. Then I remember the ambulance arriving and then I don't remember too much after that. Uh, I found out through him 
through the, the phone call many years later that I was in intensive care in a coma for three months uh, in Preston and Northcote Community Hospital. They didn't expect me to live and the day that they were actually going to pull the plug is, excuse me, is when I came back. And did that accident, did that involve another vehicle with your... No, now this is the whole thing. I eventually came home and I didn't remember anything about what had happened. I didn't remember anything about Westall. There was just nothing there whatsoever. No family members said anything. But then I remembered a, 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 I think it might have been a doctor, a doctor and nurse. They, they came to her house and they called me out to the front of where my parents' car was parked. And my parents, my father had a, an FJ Ute. That's what ran over me. And um, they said, is that your father's car? And I said, yeah. They said, tell me what you know about that car. I said, I don't really know anything, only that's my dad's car. Oh. And I still remember looking at the car, there wasn't a mark on it. It hadn't been in an accident. Mm. So, I dwelled further into my little mind and I did what I wasn't supposed to do and I rang my father back. And I said to him, did mum throw me from the vehicle? And he said, well, as far as the authorities are concerned, you fell. So there wasn't an accident as such. No. Mm. You were asleep on your mother's lap. I said, let me guess. You were asleep on your mother's lap. She said to you, if you don't want him, I don't want him either. And out the window I went, he said, oh my God. And that's it. Mm. Is that where you had a near-death experience? Where you, had, where you left your body? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Instantly. If you have a look at my face. Mm-hmm. Scars. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what happened when? What happened when you had that experience then? When you left your body? Uh, I left my body. Uh, like I said, I saw up to the point where the ambulance arrived, and again I told my father this. Being Italian, they were some somewhat religious, especially my grandmother. My grandmother always looked at me like I was an angel, even though of course I was only a kid. And uh, yeah, the ambulance arrived, I left my body. Then uh, there was a being of light, for a better word, standing next to me. And uh, as I looked around, I could see all these people standing in the shadows. I could see the accident scene, and I could see all these people in the background standing in the shadows. Uh, this light being said to me, they're afraid of the light. They're not coming out of the light, they're afraid of the light. You're not afraid of the light, eh? No. The next thing I knew, and this is where it's really strange, and this is where the connection between death and UFOs come in. I saw this thing that was cigar shaped, the size of a bus, literally come down in front of us. It was hovering just above the ground. It was bronze in colour. It reminded me of, a, a, of a, an earlier period where buses and things usually had things that come around the front and big like metal things on the front. Uh, the other thing I remember was, in a normal bus you would get a, walk over to the door and go in. This thing, we were instantly transported from where we were standing, myself and this light being, straight inside. But before that happened, the side of this bus had like laminex windows, and as I looked in the bus, um, I could, ah, oh, there's other people in there. So everything must be okay. Then full, instantly inside this thing. Then, I was standing inside this thing, and I saw this tunnel in front of me open up and this swirling light and the light beam was only very thin but it was swirling like a, a frequency, like a radio signal, very fast and I was standing at the tip of this thing and in the distance I could see a prick of light and I had the impression that I was being moved forward at a great speed and as I got closer to this light it simply opened up to an enormous size, like I'd gone in through some type of porthole. Uh, as I'd gone in past this point, I looked up to my right and I could see what looked like a, grass, a glass barrier or some kind of uh, force field. And then all these colours <laughs> that were coming from who knows where, and you could see the tails of their colours, purple and orange and, and so on, thousands of them. 
all just stopped at this glass partition and were looking at me. And I knew they were people. I had, I had the impression they were all people. Uh, then the next thing I knew, I was walking in a, in a paradise, in a garden. Um, again, with the same light being, uh, there were people all off in the distances doing things, I don't know particularly what. Uh, a couple of things that, that I remember that were very strange was, as we were walking up this laneway, uh, these flowers would, would, were appearing either side, and it's like they were alive, but it's like they were made of crystal. They were the most wonderful, dazzling colours you could ever imagine. And this being said to me, oh gee, you're having nice thoughts today. And I thought, well, that's really strange just to be able to think of something and it appears like that. Uh, then I was taken to an area that was separated from this garden, was slightly away, and I was standing next to what I can only describe as um, an altar or a, a chair. But it was the size of a 16-storey building. It was coloured pearl, and I was behind it. I was at the back. I felt like an ant. And I, I hear this voice say, uh, uh, the, the Lion of Judea wants to talk to you. I had no idea what a Lion of Judea was at that stage. I had no familiarity with the Bible whatsoever. And I kind of don't really remember what happened after that, uh, only to be back into the garden again moments later with the same being of light. Now, he basically said to me, if you want to go back, you have to cross that bridge in front of you. There was a small bridge in the garden but you're quite welcome to stay. And I said, well, I'm concerned about my mother. I think I should go back. And I still remember to this day that all these people that I saw were saying to me all in these mirror of voices, you're very brave. Why do you want to go back to that world of pain and anger when you can stay here where it's so nice? And I said, well, my concern for my mother just kind of overpowers that. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, four, I was instantly back in the hospital and awake, in immense pain. Mm. Anyway, I have another story to add to that yet. Many years later, after the abduction at Bundamba, again I said I remembered a lot of things in detail, including my death, including where I went and what happened, like I just explained. But I had a black and white monitor with a swan camera, and my son, oldest son, was at my house at that time. And he panned it past me, and I was wearing no shirt. And from the top here, down to about there, it split and come this way. It was a thumb thick, black line that went kind of mm -hmm. like that. Made some inquiries and discovered that it's equivalent to what they consider to be an autopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, it faded over years. I've actually hence checked it since, and you can't see it. My son is the only other witness to it at the time and he's had nothing to do with me for some years because of the harassment factor. They were breaking into his house and messing with him and he thought because it had something to do with me, if he doesn't have anything to do with me, it'll go away. And I haven't spoken to him for many years and I have three grandchildren that I've only seen a couple of times. It really scared him that much. So that's kind of where, where mm. I went there. So. Since your experiences over the years, mm. you've, you've said before that you've um, had harass harassment, you've had people entering your home oh, yes. and uh, affecting your computers, cameras, etc. Can you, what's been going on? Oh, okay. Uh, after the 2004 abduction, I decided to get involved in the Ipswich UFO Society. And I went along to a couple of meetings and uh, told some people uh, basically about the in 2004. I never mentioned anything to do with Westall or any of the other abductions or the accident and uh, I found that only a matter of weeks after doing that my house was being broken into during the day while I was at work. Uh, things were going missing, mainly my fuel out of my vehicle. I actually had more than one vehicle at the time, it was going missing out of all of them. Uh, I had little things going missing in the house. I had a, a webcam going on my computer and it was picking up bangs and crashes. My neighbours were telling me my alarm systems were going off. I'd come home to find my doors open, you know, my animals running in at my house as well as out of my yard. Uh, and this kind of affair has been going on ever since. Uh, I've recorded probably about uh, maybe a hundred 
light flashes in my house, uh, uh, orbs, that type of thing. Um, some of the behaviour of some of these lights uh, led me to question that it was actually human doing because they were flashing it on my guests when we had parties and, and this type of affair. Uh, they did some pretty hideous things. They, um, apart from coming into my room one night and putting a, a tracking device in my hand and tearing a, a ligament in my shoulder, it's been a constant program of harassment and then after many years I started to notice that there was a, a structure to it all and it was all a discreditation program. Every time I'd ring the police and say that something was missing and they'd come out, they'd kind of look at me, well there's no sign of entry, only small things gone missing, it's probably kids. And after a while I just give up ringing because it was, I felt it was pointless, it was only adding credence to what they wanted. Uh, the, the whole idea was to discredit me so that I would go back and tell people and they'd think I was crazy. So they discredit my word. They didn't want me talking about it and they made that quite clear. Uh, they made it clear in other ways. I, I come home one day and I was, had, tea, oh, excuse me, <coughs> had tea and was about to go to bed. And for some reason, again, I don't know why, I had to pull my sheet cover, my bed covers back before I got in, which isn't something I normally would do. And here was a spider, a black spider, very much alive in my bed. I put him in a jar and I had a look online to see what he was and he was a rainforest spider and apparently the rainforest spider is deadly and if he bites you there's no cure. It's information is available there. I still have a picture of it. Uh, the other things they did was crawl up into the roof of my house and I assume that's one of the main areas they were using to monitor me with was, was in the ceilings of the, of the homes because it happened in more than one home. Uh, I'd find the, the hatch astray. Sometimes I'd find the hatch totally gone. It wasn't even there. It was up in the roof somewhere. Another time I'd find a, a Magnum ice cream stick up in the, in the loft. Magnum. It's a gun. There was the message there. Mm -hmm. uh, I found out that most of the houses I'd lived in had automatic garage doors and I was starting to find hand and dirty fingerprints all at the bottom of the doors. Well, that's what I was getting in through the automatic garage door. Mm. That's why they had trouble getting in here because there's no automatic garage. Mm. Uh, the, the harassment extended this far and I still have the recordings. I actually have an audio program, software program, where I can break audio up, highlight, listen, clear, filter, all that sort of stuff, which is pretty common today. And uh, they were trying to make out that my wife is having an affair on me by recording us, and then changing it later, and then re it back into either my audio device or my computer. Mm. Uh, Making life difficult and challenging. I actually had to question my wife many times as to whether she was doing the right thing. But one thing never added up. We'd not long been married. Why marry if you're going to go and do that? You know, none of it really made sense. And, and being my wife and making love to my wife, I know the, the MO, I know what we mm. do, how we mm. feel, sometimes what we say, and when they, when I played it back after they'd messed with it, it didn't add up and it didn't make sense, it didn't fit. Mm. So that's why I knew it was one of their ploys. Mm -hmm. One of those very subtle but challenging yes. harassment yes. Um, protocols, basically. Mm. Yeah. They even went to the extent of actually kicking the guts out of my dogs. I have that recorded. Mm. Uh, on audio, of course, the, the cameras pick the audio up, but no footage, and I've got them uh, two different cameras, two different audios, and you can hear my dog screaming, why, and you can actually hear the boots going into the, to my staffy. And they're both quite old dogs at the time. Uh, one was 16, and he'd passed away of cancer, and the other one, which was the one that was being kicked, died of a stomach tumour. Mm. So who do you think was doing this? Military. The reason why I say that is because every house I've lived in, military has situated themselves very close to me. Uh, the abduction of 2004 where I lived, they moved in across the road two weeks after I did. I have photographs of military trucks mm. coming and going from that place. I found out that they're all military, but surprisingly enough, they didn't wear military clothes, they all wear civilian clothes. Mm. But military officers would occasionally show up. Mm. Um, I've. We moved to here, this is probably the fifth house we've moved 
since all this started and we have a military contractor moved in two weeks right behind and he's actually told us he's a military contractor. Mm. For what, what does he contract to? Air Force, that's right, yes. but he wouldn't have asked that. Yes, yes. Mm. Okay. Let's make sure. Now, if they aren't military, why is a military truck picking them up and moving their gear the same week we move? Mm. We were there, I was there for 10 years. They moved in two weeks after I did and moved out the same week after I left. Mm. Mm. At one stage, you said at one stage you were concerned about your uh, uh, mental health. Yes. Yes, and you had some examinations. Yes. What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, I started having mood swings. I started having uh, seizures and uh, basically was going downhill. Um, Prior to that, I was getting really bad headaches. I kept hearing voices at the night time, and I knew they weren't in my head. They were coming from the ceiling. I would constantly uh, hear what sounded like a buzzing, high-pitched buzzing sound. Um, I did some homework on YouTube, and I found that the, the military and police applications at that date, the most advanced technology they had were microwave devices. Uh, I started to look into how they can affect human beings and found that uh, all the symptoms I was having were pretty close to microwave technology being aimed at you. Mm. And you also had some uh, psychological examination too? Yes, I um, openly admitted to my doctor and to a psychiatrist and psychologist about uh, the abduction and, and, and what had been going on. They basically put it down to delusional fantasies and uh, uh, you know, the easy medical explanations that they could find, but they found that I was very insistent, uh, stuck to the same story, and I thought, well, I had to do that because if you don't rule out uh, the medical state you are at that time, you could be blowing wind up a pipe. Mm -hmm. But history, what I remember, timelines, evidence is all pointing to what I'm saying. Mm. It's true. Mm. Mm. So you had an experience in 2004, what happened? Yes, uh, I'll have to start from the beginning of, uh, of what really occurred there. Now, I lived in Bundamba and my girlfriend at the time lived in Riverview. Uh, we're still friends and she still lives in the same house and her and my wife are now friends. And uh, <coughs> I was walking to her place one night about eight o'clock and I was right in front of the Riverview police station. And I noticed the two red lights above in the sky were passing over above my head very slowly and this craft was cigar shaped and about a hundred metres long. And just as I noticed it, kind of awestruck, a police car pulled up. And I said to this police officer, tell me what that is, and I pointed up with my thumb. They both looked out the window and went, oh my God. And I just kept walking to my girlfriend's place. Because they're at the police station, I seen them drive the car in, but I don't know anything else about what happened there. And I went to my girlfriend's and told her what I'd just seen. About two weeks after that, I was at home, and it was about eight o'clock at night, and uh, I had a voice inside my head say, you've got to put your rubbish out. <laughs> at eight o'clock at night, I normally wouldn't do that, and my bin was at my back door. So I went out to put it, and here's this damn thing coming out of my house this time. Same story, two lights, cigar shaped, uh, very slow, silent, and not very high. I, I ran back out the front door to my neighbours across the road, uh, Anne and her mother, and they come out the street and we, the three of us stood there and watched it. We had no idea what it is. They didn't know what it is. They still remember to this day seeing it. And uh, we didn't think no more about it. And then about probably two or three days later, I woke up during the night and uh, I couldn't really understand why and I was looking at the wall and my clock red clock, alarm clock was flashing at six minutes past one in the morning. And the next thing, these three beings came through my wall and into my bedroom. My cat shot under the bed and then I was paralysed, I couldn't move, but I can still see them. Uh, they weren't as clear as normally a daylight sighting, but I could tell they were the same, the same that I'd seen before. Uh, the next thing I knew, I was being carried again above their heads 
and we floated up into this craft, like I said. They put me on, the, on this, again, the silver table. Uh, the difference this time was they carried out pretty extensive uh, examination and they did some pretty hideous things. And uh, the, one of the things that they did to me took me many, many years to come to terms with. Uh, I thought at that point that this couldn't be happening. This, this isn't real until I backed it, up, backed it up by other people's accounts. And basically what they did was they laid me down on a table, they inserted something through in behind my left ear, which I assume is the tracking device or whatever it is on the stem of my brain. They also, as I was lying there, this table split down near where my legs were this way and then came forward as to cause my legs to be bent and my knees up like I was in a straddle position similar to the way a woman would be giving birth. Mm. Uh, I woke up lying there and there was a creature in front of me. It didn't have a hood on. It was pretty well bare and it had a hold of a device that was probably about a foot long and it was in my backside. And this thing was moving it around in my backside. And the pain was immense, to the point where I think it was the pain that actually brought me around. And as I looked, again, this gets back to the screen memory, I could see my family there and uh, some friends. And I thought to myself, that's a really bad cut. <laughs> my friends and family don't look anything like that. And it was like a, an, a bad image of them. And I recognised straight away that it wasn't very good. And then, full, the image left, and this creature was there. I obviously I panicked, and I lifted my right leg. It was free, and I could move. And I kicked this damn thing in the chops, literally as hard as I could. The next thing I knew, I hear a really high pitch ringing in my head, and I passed out. It mustn't have been too long after that, probably seconds. Uh, I was dressed, and they're carrying me above their heads out of the craft but just before I left the craft and we, and we went wherever we were going the, uh, the voice said look to the right and I looked to the right and there was a lower deck a lower level and there was four people standing there with fatigues on uh, the guy on the right the first guy was a little bit taller than me the second guy was head and shoulders taller than him the guy in the middle was a six footer he was the tallest and the one on the end was stocky and short and I'm kind of I don't think it was in words. I think it was more so in my mind. I'm saying, oh, what are you doing there? And how are you going? And what's going on? And I got no reaction. They were blank stares on their faces. Their arms were by their side. Their eyes were wide open, but no movement, no reaction, nothing. And they definitely had fatigues on. Because when I first looked, I thought, what are four people doing here with pyjamas on? <laughs> I thought they had pyjamas on. And then I, I sort of looked more carefully. I went, they're not pyjamas, that's fatigues. Uh, and then the next minute again, I woke up in my bed. My clock was still flashing at six minutes past one. So I remember these things vividly. Yeah. And uh, my bed was smeared with dried blood, probably about an area about a half a metre. It was dry and it was fresh. It wasn't congealed blood, which goes a darker red. It was fresh blood. So I changed the sheets in my bed, dragged my cat out from underneath my bed and went back to sleep. The next morning I went to work and I said to my boss, I feel terrible. He said, you look like shit. He said, you better have the day off. So I had the day off and went home. Anyway, I didn't do much that day. I sat around and watched a bit of television. That night I went to bed and uh, I basically said to myself, you know, what the fuck's going on in my life? Why, why, why this blood? What's, what's, what's happening here? Uh, why do I chew my nails? What, you know, all these unanswered questions. And I went to bed that night and saw everything from Westall, the accident, abductions, in immense detail. Uh, I woke up in the morning uh, quite surprised and quite shocked. I didn't really want to go to work again, so I rang my boss and told him I still wasn't feeling well and had the day off and tried to ponder just exactly what had happened. And I really couldn't. I couldn't put an answer on anything. I had no idea. I, I, I thought this is, 
I always knew that there was something different about me and something had been going on that wasn't normal, but I could never put my finger on it. I wondered why as a young, a young man and growing up as a teenager, my mum was hell-bent on trying to get me to stop chewing my nails, but never did. I still chew it to this day. Mm. And uh, yeah, uh, I started to remember also the adoption from the two nights previous. And uh, I know they were trying to extract sperm. That, that seemed to be what their goal was, to extract sperm. Uh, they, I don't think they succeeded. So it was that experience that was the catalyst for you to have a memory recall everything. and a very big memory recall. Everything. Mm. Mm. I, ne I, I never remembered anything. Mm. Nothing. I had, I had nightmares and dreams. Mm. I had no, no recollection and memory of actually what happened, where I was at the time, the people involved. It just wasn't there. Mm. And when it, when it came back, oh boy. It came back in a flood mm. because then I started, the first thing I remembered basically was the accident. Mm. And the more I dwelled into it and the more I spoke about it, looked into the facts, then the more I remembered about Westall and, mm. and, and that type of thing. And, and it's the, look, you could come back in 10 years and I'll tell you this off the top of my head without writing it mm. down. Mm. Mm. It's so ingrained. Mm. Mm. I, 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 have a, I have a feeling that as I've gotten older, because there's been so many abduction cases, they allow you privy to certain things, uh, you know, just, just enough to say that it really happening, it's not, it's not, you're not going nuts, mm. you know. Mm. I've had a couple of events of missing time. Uh, there was an event that I haven't mentioned in there where I worked for the RSL War Veterans Homes at Pinjara Hills, I was a groundsman there. And we had a Christmas break up we had a place called the Junction in Brisbane. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a junction of a river and there's an old homestead just there, only metres from the water. And uh, it goes back to the 1800s. And there was about 200 people there. And most of the people were gathering around up the top and we were gathered down here in between the people and the, the water's edge. And there was palm trees along the water's edge. I said to a friend of mine, and I still remember this quite vividly as well, I had a jug of beer and I stuck the jug of beer on the ground where we were standing and my glass and I said to him, I'm just going down to the palm tree to have a pee, which was only five metres away, uh, safe down to the toilet, and uh, I'll be back. Well, I went down there, I remember standing there having a pee behind this pine tree, I could hear all the people talking and so on, they were just starting the speeches, and I looked out over the water and what I saw was what looked like a gold ribbon or band coming toward me like a, a band of light and it come toward me and I put my hand up like that and I thought what's that and it hit me here uh, the next thing I knew I was standing behind the palm tree you know all my clothes on I'd finished having a pee and I turned around to go and have my beer not one single person was there every single there's 200 people had left I had no idea I don't I I was shocked to say the least. I ended up driving home and when we went back to work after the holidays, I said to my friend, what the hell happened to you? I, I gave you my beer to look after and I turned on you all, no, not me, what happened to you? Anyway, <laughs> years later, there's a triangle. Right there. Mm. Feel it. Mm, there's a thickening there, isn't there? Yes. Because mm. mm. the first thing you naturally do, if you get a light coming towards you, you can't see, you go yes. like that. Yes. Uh, that particular abduction, I remember nothing. So, how many, what was the time span? Do you, did that person ever tell you that you were missing? I was gone for uh, two hours. Two hours. Mm. And the reason why, uh, other reason why I remember so, so vividly is because I was paralytic. I shouldn't have been driving home and he was my designated driver. Mm. I had to drive myself. Mm. So <laughs> that was pretty weird. The missing time episodes, I've had a couple of them, but that was the strangest. Because to turn around and, and you know all them people are there and to turn around and they're gone is strange. I walked up to my car and there was a taxi and there was one person getting in a taxi and I said, Can you excuse me, this might sound really crazy, but where's everybody gone? 
Oh, really? Well, I ain't finished, mate. Mm. <laughs> what? <laughs> How do you start here? <laughs> that was my first Christmas breakup with these people, and mm. that's that's what I endured. Mm. I knew then that it came out of the water. Mm. Did you see it dripping? Nope. No. All I saw were these bands of light come to me, mm. and I. I don't remember being taken on board. I, I don't remember what happened in those two hours. Mm. I only remember again waking up and what's gone. Were there any after effects on your body, your no. sight, nothing no. like that? I was really drunk. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that explains And I think that's it. why I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was really drunk. I, that, yeah. that was like the second or third jug I was on. Mm. And we'd only been there like half an hour. <laughs> You've got to understand, when I met so, my wife, I was drinking $200 a day in alcohol. Oh my gosh. I was earning anything up to $5,000 a week and I was buying top shelf stuff, 12 year old rums and stuff like that. Mm. You ask it. Mm. She said I was drinking myself to death. Mm. That was trying to deal with everything that was with going everything. on with me. Mm. Now I met her and she really drove home just what I was doing to myself and mm. said, you're a train wreck ready to happen. You know what? I haven't drank since. Mm. I had the occasional beer, wine, mm. nothing like I used to. Mm. Yes. Yes. It does. Yes. Lots of people have these experiences. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. They do. They do. Oh. You're not alone. <sighs> yes, the toilet's terrible. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. It's a relief to hear you say that. Yeah. We've both had experiences as well. But other, True. Yeah, but other people have other people have had all these things going on, and they don't know what to do. They no, don't. No, no one will you're listen. Lost. Yes. Yeah. If you can't convince family or friends, how can you I convince can, anybody that doesn't know you? Absolutely. You know, it's a little bit like the saying of Jesus. You, say, you know, you should know me. Mm. I, I I brought up from amongst you and, and this sort of stuff. Don't don't you believe me? Yes. No. Yeah, it must be really difficult being estranged from your son. Frustrating. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. I tried to say to my son, look, <coughs> I don't know who these people are. I can sh I, I can only s summarise that they are military. Mm. He said, Dad, he said, I come to your place, I go home, and here's the children's teddy bears lined up sitting in the hallway. Mm. He said, that's just some of the games they're playing with us. And he rang me up crying and said, I don't know who the hell these people are. I feel in fear for my children. I've had enough, I'm blah, blah. And he hasn't rang me or contacted me in probably three years. Mm. Mm. And I started having friends uh, coming up to me and telling me police were pulling him over and asking questions about me and how do you know this man and what's your association with him? And, and I said, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they just pull you up for normal police stuff. He mm. said, that's what we couldn't understand. Mm. They never asked for my license. They, it's like they already knew who I was. Yes, yeah, yeah. Anyway. I've had lots of people cry, tears of relief that they're not the only oh, ones that it's mate, happening you to. You don't know how many tears I've shed over this. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm. Who can you tell? Mm. And before I met my wife, I was on my own. Mm. You know, even she. Probably thought after she married me, what the hell have I got myself in for? Yeah, yeah. But until she started hearing, seeing, feeling some of the experiences. Uh, yeah. Hmm. yeah. And no matter how hard I tried to convince the medical establishment that there was some uh, genuine reasons as to why these things are happening and I have marks and so on, they really didn't want to know about it. Mm -hmm. No, they don't. No. It's too big, too difficult, can't digest it. Too hard box. Yeah, too hard. Yep. And you know, let's face it, what can you do? Well, I showed them that in my hand. Mm. They're trying to tell me it's a Viking's claw. Mm. I said, a Viking's claw, so that must be flesh, yes? Yes. Uh, tendon flesh, they yeah. did, yes. What the magnet spin on there? Yeah. Oh my God, that's a good party trick. Yes, yeah. I know. It's not a party trick, it's evidence made. Mm. Those, those, those doors of people's minds just have to open from Close. the inside out. Yes. That you can't open them for them. Yeah. That's, that's, that's correct. That's why I think people in a professional capacity that have this sort of thing happen to them must be very hard. Mm. And there are a lot. They yep. sit quietly. Yeah. Scientists, yep. you know, mental health professionals, yep. they don't talk about yep. it. 
They know the consequences. Yeah. Yeah. I had a friend that worked with me at uh, uh, the Meatworks, and uh, we, we previously both worked for the previous contractor. I took over his contract and did it for 10 years, right? Mm. But before that, there was a guy there, Peter, and I was telling him about some of the things, and <coughs> oh, excuse me, showing marks on my body. And he came to work one day and he said, oh, Derek, have a look at this. And he pulled up his shirt and there was a triangular marks on his body, mm. on his stomach. And I said, when did that happen? He said, last night. Mm. 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 I also have night vision cameras. I've got two in there. And whenever I go outside here of a night time, I get flashed. Front of the house, back of the house. I'll go to a friend's house, flashed. Mm. I'll go to a person that I know that lives at the base of Toowoomba and I'll get the IR out and I'll put it up like that and a tree stump about 200 metres away is a figure about three feet high. Mm. Mm. Flash left, right and centre yeah. all the time. The, the only thing to correspond with these flashes was a um, military detection devices, the, mm. the stuff they have on helicopters and, and the like. They look exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Why would the why would they do they have to flash? Can they do it? Um, well, they're both quietly? no. Well, if they do it normally, you you can't see it. There's no beam. Yeah. There's no direction. Yeah. But when I get out there with the IR, they can see the beam of the oh, IR. Yes, and, of course, they, yeah. and they're basically saying, "Yeah, we're still here." Yeah, yeah. We're still watching you. Mm. And my my belief has come to the point where the the military really aren't involved mm. as far as what's going on with the abductions and so on, They're, that's purely alien. Because you've got to say to yourself, okay, a couple of things. One is, Westall, why would the military be testing uh, vehicles that close to an urban environment, let alone near a school? You wouldn't do it, especially if you didn't want to be noticed and keep it all such a secret. It's somewhere else. Mm. But yet here it was. Mm. Uh, the insistence on, on them wanting to cover everything up, the insistence on wanting to shut me up, the insistence on wanting to discredit me leads that they know something we don't. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're watching me leads me to believe that the best way to get access to them is to watch the people they're involved with. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. I have many hours of lights flashing in this house mm -hmm. and I've compared them to many things uh, right, I mean, there's a thing called a thermal eye. They're about $20,000. And they're probably one of the best things that a civilian can buy without going into military applications. Now, if you're gonna spy on somebody, you're gonna do it in such a way that they have no way of knowing where you are or how you're doing it. And that's exactly what these people are doing. Mm -hmm. With the 2004 abduction, you mm -hmm. talked about, and previously talked about, um, having uh, health problems after that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's starting the very next day. What mm -hmm. happened? Oh, uh, well, just, are you talking about the health problems as far as how I felt or about the remembrance? No, actually you say here, um, every time you went to the toilet, you were passing oh, blood. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I'd go to the toilet and I was passing blood and it was, it was fresh blood. And uh, the couple of hours that had gone by, I was getting weaker and weaker. So I rang my girlfriend at Review and she came over and I managed to pass a blood clot about the size of a um, golf ball and I put it in a jar and I went to my regular male doctor and he said to me, oh, you've got internal piles, don't worry about it, go home. And I went home and I said to my girlfriend at the time, I said, this is not piles, there's something else wrong here. She said, well, you need to go and see my doctor and she had a female doctor at Goodna. So we headed straight down. Uh, her doctor examined me and said, I suggest you drive your boyfriend to the hospital immediately. So we went to the Ipswich General Hospital. I was admitted. Within a few minutes, they examined me because I could hardly stand. And they put me into surgery within a half an hour. Uh, the surgeons operated on me. They discovered a 40 centimetre cut in my colon, high up in my colon, not down low, and uh, stitched me up. I was in the hospital probably another three or four hours after that, and then they sent me home. Uh, I was still very weak, although I was starting to gain more strength slowly over time. Um, the, the surgeon that performed the operation actually rang me uh, that night and said to me, uh, do you have any idea as to how that happened to you? And I said, no. I said, I really, really 
don't have, and I wasn't about to tell him about the abduction. So I just basically said, I, I really don't know how it happened. And he said it was a, the cleanest cut I've ever seen. And normally when we get to thing problems with colons, it's usually a tear. Very rarely it's a cut like that. Uh, no foreign bodies were present to determine like glass and what have you that could have caused that. And even then, it's never a straight cut like that. And he said basically that if you hadn't come in and I operated, he said you wouldn't have woke up in the morning. Mm. And uh, I've had, uh, again, uh, two more bowel operations since that with problems. Mm. They, they don't know why. The last time they had me up there, uh, I was up there for three days. Every time they were going to operate, an emergency would come in and they'd, I'd be put on the back burner. Eventually, I, uh, with a nurse, went into the shower and passed a blood clot about the size of a grapefruit. It was soft and everything, but when it hit the ground, it just went everywhere. And uh, I felt a lot better after that, and its things started to improve. The lump was no longer there. And the doctors all came around and said to me, oh, here's the famous healer. And I said, yeah, well, you have to wait long enough around here to get help. You've got to do it yourself, <laughs> And uh, basically they wanted to examine me. I still remember the little Chinese surgeon, she'd say, I need to put my finger, have a look. I said, yeah, that's all right. So long as that bloke over there with the bloody big hands don't do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that's what happened that day. So what do you think is going on with you and with other people like you? Well, uh, as I got older and, I, and, and they abducted me, I, I, they, they didn't talk to me or tell me uh, what their intentions were. I, I kind of had to paint a picture myself. And uh, it, it's been a, a constant, uh, um, say, a, co um, a constant, roll of the same dice all the time. Sperm, sperm, that type of thing. So I, I did some research, uh, it probably took me a number of years, and I found that there was a lot of other cases of uh, induction scenarios, as the same as what had happened to me. And uh, I, I, I looked into uh, DNA uh, and how it works. Um, I looked into what they could possibly be achieving through what they're doing. Uh, again, backed up with the evidence that I saw, uh, and I've drawn a conclusion that it is a genetic program designed uh, to create hybrid beings, uh, for a better word, part us, part them. And I think the reason for that is because they have lost the genetic coding a long time ago, and they needed to retrieve genetic material, uh, hence the reason why they're here. But I think it was a little bit more involved than that. I actually think what I like to call the original primes or the original inhabitants of that, that particular planet realised the path they were going down, which is very similar to what we're facing today, the development of AI, or clones and hybrids and so on. They developed them to such a point where they eventually ruled their society and took over and eventually superseded their, their original hosts. And of course, thousands of years had gone by and they've developed ever since. Uh, somewhere along the line, they, they lost the ability to, to reproduce, but had to start to replicate. Now, under replication in a um, material universe can only last so long. And usually maybe only as long as that universe is going to last. So they kind of realised that uh, the only way for us to live forever or to have immortality was to gain some original DNA that was uh, left behind by the original primes. Now the original primes were the ones that went out and seeded the universe with their DNA. Uh, it wasn't hard for the current clones and aliens to find out where that was done because they simply had to look in their own records. So they did. And hence the reason why they're here on Earth, hence the reason why they're taking our DNA. Uh, because you'd say to yourself, if they're really only after clone beings, you know, uh, they could do that themselves without our DNA. But for some reason our DNA was very important to them. You know, if you look at uh, into DNA and genes and how they're formed and how they're made and what they do, they're actually uh, 
certain genes in DNA, and we know this for a fact, that have been switched off. They're like a fossil gene. And uh, for some reason, they go back many thousands of years. Scientists know this. And they are probably the rawest form of DNA that one can be extracted from a human body. And I feel that that's what they're after. Uh, a lot of people are saying that they're here to warn us of the doom and gloom of the earth. I think that's just part of their mission. Uh, they are prepared to warn us from ourselves, but at the same time, what they're really important to them is, is you know, their, um, their operation. They, that's really what's imperative to them. A lot of people say that they don't feel that they have emotions or feelings. They do. But I find the only time they ever show them is when there's a, a completion or they're happy about the results of what they've achieved. As far as everyday emotion is concerned toward us, it doesn't exist. It's only emotion toward their own program. Uh, the clones, for a better word, that they're creating will not come back here to Earth. There's no need for that. They're going to take them back from wherever they came from. Um, they've actually stated to some humans, females especially, that the, the fetuses were removed from, that you know, we know you'd like to take her, but she will not survive with you. Well, if they're saying that to you then, what makes you think they're going to bring them back to later day? That's not the case. Mm. We have a genetic material that's useful to them. They don't want to influence our society, although they're doing it inadvertently. Uh, they don't want to be known. That's the last thing they want. Uh, and there are other reasons for that as well. Um, but that's, that's where we're at. A lot of people talk about alien abduction experiences as having a, a positive or a negative agenda. Do you see either of those or somewhere in between? Well, it's, it's obviously a positive thing for them. or well, they wouldn't be going to that much trouble. Uh, on the whole, uh, if people can get a good experience out of it, I think that's good. But I also think that's a little bit naive because to be taken against your will, regardless of the motives, is never good. Uh, you know, you can take me away and shout me lollies and drinks and then put me back with it doesn't mean to say I really enjoyed it. Uh, but if some people look at it that way, I think that's a good thing for them. As far as we are concerned, uh, I get the impression that there's going to be a huge cull of the human species and it'll probably be our own doing. Um, yeah. Mm. There's a couple of other things I'd like to mention. Mm. Uh, apart from studying the UFOs and, and DNA and and what's been happening to me, West, all the all that sort of stuff. There's kind of another side to it uh, that I often uh, think of that I don't think too many people do, and that is if uh, you do have a culling of the human species by their own mistake, how do you fix it? Can we be left to solve a problem we've created, or do we need help? Um, and probably the most obvious thing that's going to be missed if that ever happens is human DNA. Mm. Um, I can understand why it's covert. I can understand why they don't want us to know the reason why we're, we're remembered paralysed or unconscious. Um, but I don't agree with what our own are doing. I really don't. I, th I think they, they need to be more supportive, need to be more honest and uh, bring this thing out in the open. I don't, uh, all the secrecy and cloak and dagger stuff is just terrible, terrible. How do you think the population would respond if they did go? Badly, badly. I think like any change in society, it's the same as humans. We don't like change, let alone something we don't understand. And I think it's something that'll need to be addressed over a long period of time. And as our technology increases, we will know more and more. And of course, eventual generations will have a much more accepting um, attitude toward it than the current ones. And I think that's where we'll be headed. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think eventually the human race will know. We, we, it, it's inevitable, it's part of our evolution to know, but we're not ready yet. Mm -hmm. We've got too many religious evangelists out there, too many people that really wouldn't accept it 
and would say it's a plot, it's the end of the world and what have you. And yeah, that's what you'd end up with. Mm. One my last thing I wanted to ask you was the reason you contacted me was because you found my name came up with yes. the connection between extraterrestrials and the afterlife. Well, what happened was I kind of decided when I was really sick that if I was to pass away next week, who would know? No one. I would not even be a memory. So I, you weren't by accident. I did some research. I looked into who I thought would be open-minded enough to hear what I had to say, and there were a lot that weren't. And uh, through UFO community and so on. And uh, reading through some of your um, near-death experiences and so on, and, and some of the literature that you had on your website, and you, you were spot on. I wasn't about to go anywhere near someone that was fanciful and was in it for the money. I wasn't about to go anywhere near someone I felt was more so interested in the paranormal and not anything else. So you kind of fit in all the avenues, so you were my, my target. You see? Okay, I can accept that. It's in mine too. <laughs> but it's true. There are only certain individuals that can prompt that in you. You know, and they were like, like, for example, as far as I'm concerned, Bud Hopkins was a pioneer. Mm. Uh, Miss Turner, a pioneer. Mm. You're also a pioneer. Okay. You are. <laughs> I put you up in the class of those people because you are putting yourself out there. And it's not easy and mm. it can be dangerous. Mm. I know for a fact that some investigators have been killed by these, not aliens, military. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, Cheryl's about the best in Australia. Well, there's, there's, <laughs> not, there's, there's, Thank you, there's no, no there's no one really. A lot of them out there pretend to be. Yeah. They've never had experiences. They know very little about it. And they certainly don't know about Westall. No. Mm. 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 No, look, we appreciate you. Uh, mm. I'm not in it for the money. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. I'm not in it for the glory. I'm not in it for the fame. Mm -hmm. I'm in it to tell my story and to bring to light what so many of us are going through. And I think the more people that do and the more you can collate the facts and say, hey, look, it seems to be a common thread here. And that's the strongest evidence we have mm. as human beings. Mm. They're not about to land in the backyard and say, come and take photos of this. That isn't going to happen. So we have to deal with what we've got. Mm. And again, sourcing humans is a very important part of telling a story. Hence the reason why you're here. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you. That's we right. appreciate I thank you, you doing that. Well, thank well, you. Thank both of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. No, Is there anything weird. else you want to say? Because uh, you're always welcome to say something in the future. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. That's right. Um, it's quite profound that this type of thing can happen to a person. Uh, <clears throat> if there wasn't any marks, if there wasn't any memories only scattered memories, and there wasn't any other witnesses, you'd probably go on with your life and not give it a second thought. But where they made the mistake, especially with me, was doing it repeatedly, because I didn't miss a trick. And I, I was determined that I was going to find out, not the bigger picture, but I was going to find out what's happening to me. And when I started to read of other cases where I saw similarities, at first I still didn't believe. But upon reading more and more similarities, I couldn't deny it. Couldn't deny it. That's a good point, actually. Actually, the, con the continuous application of those experiences to individuals mm. is actually the down undoing. That's right. Yes. The same MO. Mm. So, yeah. Same as the military, same Emma. Mm. Mm. I said to my wife a while ago, I said, uh, they break into our house. We went to the coast for the weekend. And she said, how do you know it's them? Same Emma. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes, 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 very true. Mm. If they did it once, you'd move on with your life. You wouldn't yeah, worry about it. Oh, jeez, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, which actually happened to me once. <laughs> oh, true. But they never kept doing it, so I, I just thought, oh, kids broke in. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's it. It's kind of weird, but when they first talk to you in your head, it's really strange mm. because you know you haven't heard it and you know they're talking directly to your head, you know, mm. talking directly to your mind. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, that really makes sense. Mm. Excuse me, because you're an advanced civilization. Whenever you talk words through the air, it's a very slow process. Mm. And the thought power is very yes, quick. Yes, yeah. Mm. Can we get a shot of your hand with yep. putting the magnet yeah. on? Yep. I said it might not work every time. That's why I was glad you saw it before. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> See that? I, I didn't push that. That would be by itself. And also, it's got to be seemed for some reason can only work one way. It doesn't work both ways. Oop. No, it's not going to do it again now. Oof. Did you get that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And it has a definite opening this end, and you can see mm. where it's been put in into them. I got the impression she was synthetic. I didn't, I didn't feel that when I was touching her that she was human, and, and that's what really put me off. I, I felt like she was artificial, and she had like a, what can I say? She didn't have a sweet smell about her like humans. It was sickly sweet. Does that make any sense? She was about this high. She wasn't very tall. Uh, and, and did we get the whole story of that? <laughs> <laughs> did we get the whole story? No, you started before I was ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I'll show you this after. Just All right. So tell us, when was this? Uh, this was a pretty early, uh, 1995 ish. They um, come and took me from my room. Uh, I don't remember seeing beings or anything like that, but I get the sensation of floating. I remember that. And uh, again, laying down on a, on a silver table. Um, I don't remember vomiting or, or being nausea or anything like that, but I do remember being sponge bathed. Well, after they took all my clothes off, they sponge bathed me, these, these two smaller beings, and uh, I kind of instantly dried. And then she walked in from the same area where they walked out, and I noticed her straight away because she looked more human than the rest. Um, she was attractive in, in, in a sense, but, but Probably an attractive alien, not an attractive human. And uh, her features were, were very prominent, just like them. Um, rather oversized for her, or Korean. Uh, very small chin, no lips. Uh, she did have ears, they were quite small. A nose, yes. Uh, mouth. Uh, again, I don't remember whether she had teeth or not. Uh, sickly. The, the, smell, the smell reminded me of an old granny's horrible perfume sickly sweet and that was uh, that was kind of a put off immediately then when I touched her her, her skin and her flesh was very soft and uh, uh, almost spongy like and I, I, it didn't feel real it didn't it, it felt um, artificial um, like the whole thing was was basically a put off for me um, she, what, what did she, do? she didn't touch me uh, I never touched her I was simply laying back and she she straddled over me. I had an erection, but I wasn't aroused. And uh, she tried uh, to insert me into her, and uh, I just really didn't want a part of it. And as she, the more she tried, the less aroused I got, till eventually she just jumped up and holding her belly walked away. Then the two greys come in, two small grey ones come in, and they dressed me and up I went. And, and where were, what happened after that? I woke up in my bed. Yeah, she um, 
The head was very strange because, apart from the fact that it wasn't the right shape, it moved or tilted very quickly left and right like a, a lotus head, like a, the head of a praying mantis. And, uh, that was really strange, really strange. But her eyes, her eyes were blue. Well, probably twice the size of a human's. Um, pupils were quite different. They, they were more elongated than round. Things like that. Did she communicate with you? No, nope. no. Nope. Didn't say anything. Didn't, didn't hear anything in my head. Nothing. No. It was, it was like it was all body language. Like she's looking at me, saying as if to say, you know, you know what I want to do. You just have to lie back and let me do my job, sort of thing. But I wasn't really having a bar of it. I didn't, literally. <laughs> <laughs>